we would like to thank and acknowledge our sponsors, DC3 Dreams and Voice Astro. DC3 Dreams provides high-end observatory automation and web-based multi-user remote imaging. The AAVSO Net Observatories use DC3 Dreams ACP Expert for the bright star monitors and other programs. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey Project, also known as APAS, has used ACP Expert's AI scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields, hands off, at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night. This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects in about 99% of the sky. The Voice Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please check out their webpage to learn more about their work. All right, now, our first of today's speakers is a professor of astrophysics at the University of Southampton. In the past, he spent time working at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore and was even awarded a Hubble Fellowship, which he took up at Columbia University. His research focuses on accretion physics in the general sense and cataclysmic binaries specifically, as he sees them as an ideal laboratory for studying accretion physics. And by the end of his talk, I imagine we'll all be agreeing with him. Without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to introduce Dr. Christian Kniga. Okay. <clears throat> my screen share here so you can get started. Great. Thanks very much for a very kind intro. Let me try and share my screen with you. I, I should warn you that I had a couple of technical issues earlier, so hopefully this won't happen again. Uh, so, switching. And shall we? There we go. Is that working? Yes, it is. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So, yes, hopefully there'll be no glitches. So, what I hope to talk about today is, is using cataclysmic variables as universal accretion laboratories. And as Lauren already said, that's something that's really close to my heart. Uh, I, my background really started in working in, in cataclysmic variables, which I think a lot of uh, amateur astronomers know and love. These are accreting white dwarfs. I'll go more into that in a minute. Um, but since then, I've branched out a lot. And the one thing that basically I've realized is that an awful lot of accretion physics seems to be very, very similar. And, um, you know, the sort of more sexy objects that people often talk about, black holes, neutron stars, even quasars, uh, you know, they, they have a lot more appeal to people sometimes. But it turns out that if you want to understand the physics of what's really going on, turns out the good old CVs are the best place to study it. Uh, so um, let me just jump straight in. What I'm planning to do is give you a little bit of a uh, primer into what these things actually are. Uh, it turns out there's quite a lot of um, taxonomy, different classes and so on that people sometimes get confused about. And I'm gonna try to make that really easy and tell you what these sort of systems really are, what they're like and which ones I'm going to particularly talk about uh, and what makes them so useful. And then I'm going to try and explain how and why I think these are fantastic laboratories for understanding accretion physics. Um, and the way I'll try and do that is actually sort of by starting from some of the big puzzles that people have uh, recently come across, some of the most important phenomenology, weird behavior that people have observed in neutron star and black hole systems, which, which is where a lot of current really good research is done. And then I'm going to try and show you that we actually, it turns out that we see the same behavior in accreting white dwarfs too, which was not something that was really necessarily thought. Uh, and the reason it wasn't really thought is because people used to think, I think, that most of the crazy behavior you might see in a black hole, for example, would have to do with, you know, the fact that it's a black hole. It's a weird system. It's, you know, it's got strong gravity. It's got general relativity, all this kind of stuff, things that don't really matter that much in a, in a white dwarf. Um, but it turns out that whatever black holes can do pretty much, CVs can do too. And CVs have a lot of advantages if you want to understand that. 
So that's what I'm going to try. So I'm going to start that second part basically by looking at what the phenomenology is that people are really desperately trying to understand in accretion. And then I'm going to hopefully show you that CVs display this and give us hints as to what's really going on. Okay, so let me jump straight in with a primer on what these things actually are. What are cataclysmic variables? Well, cataclysmic variables are accreting white dwarfs. Uh, and so I'll, I'll show, have a few pictures in a minute, but fundamentally what that means is just that there's a white dwarf, which is the end product of something as a low mass star like our sun. So our sun will become that in about 5 billion years. And they have a partner and it's a very close binary system and they accrete from their partner. Uh, so it's a white dwarf in a very nearby system from, with, a, with a secondary star and the secondary star dumps mass onto this thing. And then there's a whole different bunch, a huge sort of taxonomy of what kind of things can happen, which, which are distinguished by things like what the companion is, like if the companion, you can see here, if the companion is a, another white dwarf, we call that AMC Gens. If, if it's a main sequence star, then that's kind of a normal cataclysmic variable. If it's a symbiotic star, then that turns out to be something that has a giant companion. And then there are, if it's, so we're gonna focus in this talk only on the things I've labeled here in, in red. Uh, so the systems with white dwarf and main sequence companions, they can be split again. If the secondary star is, is sort of high mass, we call that a super soft source for reasons we don't have to go into, but we're gonna talk about the ones that have low mass companions. So the white dwarf in this system is maybe one solar mass and the secondary star is less massive than that. It's just a normal main sequence star, maybe you know, half the mass of our sun or something. And that's the sort of bread and butter of vanilla kind of uh, cataclysm variable. And in fact, you can split that up even further. You can talk about whether or not this secondary star is really on the main sequence still, meaning it's really still burning hydrogen to helium like a good old fashioned normal star should, or whether there's already a little bit of, uh, it's already gone a bit off the main sequence. But we're gonna talk again about the sort of vanilla flavored, you know, classic white dwarf, completely normal low mass star next to it. That's what we're gonna talk about. Uh, that's how you can split these things up in taxonomy based on what the components are. Now, the other way to split, the, split them up is by how they behave essentially and, and how the accretion process works. And here, the way in which people split these up is first by looking at whether or not the white dwarf has a very strong magnetic field. And what do we mean by strong? Basically by whether or not its, uh, it, its presence, the presence of the field affects the accretion process. Okay, so we might have a, a white dwarf that has a field that is so strong that it really changes the way in which mass gets dumped onto the white dwarf. So to give you an example here, uh, if I look at the so-called polars, these are the ones with the absolutely strongest fields. And the sort of system you're then talking about, this should really be a little animation, which may or may not work. Oops. Well, I apologize, this animation isn't quite working. But you can actually see what the key things that I'm trying to show here anyway. So this is, you, you can see here the secondary star, which is the big blob. It's dumping mass through the stream onto the little blue object in the middle, which is the white dwarf. And what's happening here is that the magnetic field of this white dwarf is so strong that it disrupts the stream before anything else can happen really. So basically straight from the stream, material gets kind of siphoned off onto the magnetic poles of the white dwarf. And that's, we call those things polars. The second type is, is if you have somewhat weaker magnetic field on the white dwarf, but still strong enough to make a difference. And in those systems, you can have behavior like this. And again, I apologize that this animation isn't working, but it doesn't matter too much. Um, what you can see here is again, this matter stream from the secondary star, and it now actually forms an accretion disk. And so the field of the white dwarf still matters, but only at the inner edge of the disk. And you can probably just barely see this here that if you look in the sort of center of the disk, you can see in the middle, there's this sort of accretion curtain thing sort of raised above the disk. And so here that basically the field from the white dwarf truncates the disk. So you have a sort of partial accretion disks in these systems. And those are sort of very interesting systems in their own right. And we call those intermediate polars. Uh, and these are sort of the 
the sort of intermediate place between really strong fields that just that's the only thing that matters and pure disks where the field just is irrelevant for the accretion process. And that brings us in fact to the systems where the field is irrelevant to the accretion process and we call those things either nova likes or dwarf novae and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but that's what these guys look like. Okay, so they just have a, a secondary star dumps mass onto the white dwarf and it forms an accretion disk and here the accretion disk goes all the way into the white dwarf. So these are the sort of simplest systems you can think of, right? And actually this is the beauty of CVs really if you're interested in accretion. It's that, you know, we've understood how this process accretion, how this process should work in, in, this, in its simplest setting for oh, I don't know, maybe 50 years now or something like that. But there are a lot of approximations made in when you try to describe this, this, uh, this accretion process. And what's nice is that cataclysmic variables are the one type of systems where virtually all of these approximations that people normally like to make should really hold because they're essentially very simple systems. There's, they're, you know, they're, they're compact, but they're not nearly as compact as a neutron star or black hole, magnetic fields, you know you can ignore them. The stars here are normal, the abundances are normal, everything is kind of normal. And that's, you know, sounds boring, but it makes it really interesting. Because if you want to understand the physics of what's going on, you want to have the simplest possible system. So you have a control of before you worry about really complicated effects due to, I don't know, general relativity or something. So these systems should be your sort of absolutely baseline, you know, this is how accretion works. Now, why are there two types? Why do I say there are nova likes and dwarf novae? Well, to the observers here, that's not gonna be great, greatly surprising. Um, essentially, the nova likes are systems that accrete in a steady way and the dwarf novae, as the name implies, actually uh, they erupt. Um, maybe every few weeks to every few months, and I won't go into that in detail why that is here. Uh, we'll come back to that later. Uh, but basically, they just show uh, outbursts, maybe, like I say, on this sort of weekly time scale, where, where they brighten and then fade again. And that's due to a, a, an instability in, in the accretion disk. And we'll come back to that. I won't go through uh, too much more here, but, except to say that there are some special classes that I'm not going to talk about at all. Um, one special class is Novi, uh, and I just wanted to mention that since some of you may very well have heard of Novi, and I've just mentioned dwarf Novi. But Novi are also CVs, but they're kind of a different thing. Essentially, every maybe 10,000 years or so, because they accrete material from the secondary star, this material piles up on the white dwarf, and eventually it reaches a critical pressure. Um, and when it does, what happens is that it undergoes a thermonuclear runaway. And these things are novae. So it can be kind of confusing when you first hear about dwarf novae, novae, and supernovae. Um, but actually, uh, dwarf novae are essentially just normal CVs where the disk kind of goes up and down. Novae are systems where the white dwarf undergoes a thermonuclear runaway. The stuff on the surface erupts. Uh, the white dwarf still survives, but but for that period, uh, essentially probably the disk is destroyed for a, for a time. And this only happens every, like I say, 10,000 years or so. And then supernovae are something different again, where the white dwarf genuinely disrupts completely. Um, so they're different types of, uh, of things really. The fact that they're all called novae can actually be a bit misleading. And then there are some really odd systems uh, like the famous A query, which have a different kind of actually accretion geometry, which I won't go into, but it turns out it, there's even some systems where the white dwarf uh, has a strong magnetic field and it's rot rotating so fast that it actually prevents material from accreting at all. And it, it's then in, instead, it just throws all that material out. We call that a magnetic propeller. Okay, so what are these systems really like then? I've sort of given you a quick uh, sort of overview of the different classes, but the ones we're going to talk about now, these very simple ones, non-magnetic ones that don't do anything special, what do they really look like? What are the sort of characteristics? So as I say, they, they have a white dwarf primary, maybe just under a solar mass. They have a main sequence secondary, which is sort of a red dwarf, maybe half a solar mass, maybe less. Um, what's really nice is that their orbital periods are 
on the order of a few hours, right? And that's great. That's probably also why a lot of you have observed them and are still observing them because that's just fantastic for, for an observer. We, we like things that change on time scales that matter. So CVs are fantastic because they actually might show orbital variations on the time scales of a single night. Um, and then if there's things like dwarf novae, they will show dramatic outbursts on time scales of a few weeks, which is fantastic, right? So from a purely observational point of view, that's beautiful. Now, again, as I've said, these things uh, accrete via an accretion disk around the white dwarf. This accretion disk is really what we're interested in. Uh, and what makes them so, such great laboratories, as I say, is that they're simple, but also that they're quite bright systems. Um, they are very nearby, much closer because there's so, there's so many of them that the nearest ones are within, I don't know, 100 light years or so, a few hundred light years. And that's much, much closer than the closest um, say black hole or something like that. So it makes them very easy to study. And, and because they're simple, we can study them in great detail and really understand the physics. The sort of uh, components of these systems look a bit like this. So uh, when you hear me talk about this, and I, and I won't go into all of these things, but I just wanted to sort of show you how even a simple object um, can be quite complicated. And also how white dwarfs compared to neutron stars and why it's in a way, well, both interesting and surprising that some of the, the, the phenomenology they display is actually quite similar. So here is the sort of key components that you have in any of these uh, accreting systems. So you have, you know, you have the disks, the secondary star, um, you might have a, a accretion stream between them. This hotspot is just the place where the stream hits the, the, the accretion disk. Something we might talk about if we have time is that it turns out these, these things often drive an outflow from sort of a, what's called a disk wind from the surface of the disk. Uh, systems might have jets, so they might actually display, drive radio jets from the very center of the, uh, of, the, of the accretion disk. So these are highly collimated things that emit mostly radio. This is distinct from the disk wind. Um, between the disk and the central object, there might be something called a boundary layer because nobody quite knows really how that works. Like how do you really transition from a normal accretion disk to, a, to, a, to the compact object? So there's an awful lot going on. And then also the disk and the white dwarf, actually because they put out a lot of radiation, so they will actually heat up the surface of the secondary uh, and that can also cause observational effects. So there's a whole bunch of different things going on in these systems. So it's not, you know, I've made them sort of sound simple, but even in simple systems, there's a lot happening. Now, what's interesting is that you can sort of see how between white dwarfs and neutron stars and black holes, for example, you might expect these things to be, you know, somewhat different. Uh, for, as a good example, jets are things that people really had only expected to be present in neutron stars and black holes because we think these must be some sort of relativistic thing. You'd think, you know, people think that maybe the spin of the black hole is critical to make a jet. Um, also, we might think that this heating effect might only matter really in neutron stars or black holes because they emit much more X-rays uh, and that's really much more suitable for doing that. And just to sort of show you uh, again, sort of both the pros where these things kind of emit, so in, in basically all systems, the things on the right here, so the secondary star, the hotspot, the outer disk, all of the radiation here comes out always in the optical or maybe the infrared, maybe sort of the, the ultraviolet still. But that's the same in all these different systems. It's the same in neutron stars, it's the same in black holes, it's the same in white dwarfs. And that's just simply because Ultimately, all the energy, you know, the, the secondary stars are the same. The rate at which material gets transferred is comparable. Uh, and in that sort of outer disk region, the material doesn't really know whether the central object is a white dwarf or a neutron star or something else. So all of the behavior here is more or less the same. And it's basically all emitting in the same kind of region of the spectrum. Things get different when you look uh, at what's happening closer to the center. So here, it turns out that because the disk, basically white uh, neutron stars and black holes are just a lot smaller than, uh, than white dwarfs. So the disk extends a lot further in, and that means the disk in 
emitting white dwarfs can really only emit maybe ultraviolet, but in Newton stars and black holes, it emits a ton of X-rays. Okay, so that's a that's a big difference. Um, again, then you might talk about the central object. What happened? You know, what does it emit? Well, if it's a black hole, it emits nothing. It's a black hole. Uh, if it's a neutron star, loads of X-rays. If it's a white dwarf, probably only ultraviolet again. So again, fairly big differences there that you would expect to make a difference to all kinds of things. If you look at that interaction region, uh, again, we know that that is purely X-rays in black holes and neutron stars, but it's it's really a bit softer and more ultraviolet -y in the white dwarf systems. And then finally, disk wind signatures. Uh, we now we've seen these now, and we we think these should be in the X. These are only in the X-rays in neutron stars and black holes. Although there's recent work that suggests maybe that's not even quite true. Uh, but mostly that's where they are seen. And in white dwarfs, we mostly only see them again more in the softer optical UV. And the theme here, of course, is always the same in all of these things, that basically anything where you're looking at uh, the inner parts of the accretion flow in neutron stars and black holes, this inner part is much closer in and therefore much harder and emits much higher energy radiation, more like X-rays, whereas in white dwarfs, which are larger, you, it always comes out more like ultraviolet. And then finally, we have the radio jet, which you would expect to be mostly radio. Uh, and in white dwarfs, of course, there's even a question whether they should have radio jets. Uh, because, you know, could you even have a jet in a system that isn't relativistic? So let's talk now about why I think these things should be such great are, in fact, such great laboratories for understanding accretion. So uh, here, this slide again, I apologize, this isn't really, looks like I'm having some trouble with the animations in this, in this uh, display. Doesn't matter though. I've mentioned earlier that dwarf novae exhibit these eruptions uh, on time scales of you know, a few weeks or so. And that's due to an instability in the accretion disk. Now, it turns out black holes and neutron stars do the same thing. So there are black hole and neutron star, uh, black hole and neutron star analogs to dwarf novae. And what's really interesting is that, that people I think have realized for quite some time that the physics of this is probably the same, but what's really interesting as to an observer is that if you compare, and again, I can't quite, let me just see if I can actually just briefly go out of this and see if I can show you this yeah let me just delete this for a minute just so you can at least see this right let me delete this real-time surgery that's not really what i intended to do but it'll work so what i'm showing you on the right here is a light curve of a particular uh, black hole binary. And you can see it shows that it shows again, sort of a, you know, a, a, this is what we're looking at here is essentially brightness on the y axis and time on the x axis. And there's really quite few systems where we have seen more than one or two or three outbursts. There are a handful, but there's not many. And you can see that data is pretty sparse. You know, we don't, we don't have great data on this. We can see that they go into outbursts, they decline from the outburst. But whenever I give a talk to people who study neutron stars and black holes, I always make a point of putting up the light curve on the left, which is SS Cygni, which should look very familiar to most of you, because that's, of course, from the AAVSO database. And, and I think it always comes as a shock to people who study black holes and neutron stars that we have data of this kind of quality for this amount of time on the same physical thing, which is this disk instability that they are interested in too. And so we still, you know, we understand the basics of how this instability works. We have done for quite some time, but there's lots of details as I'll show you in a minute that we don't understand. And so I think it always comes as a shock to people in the other field when we sort of show plots like this and say, hey, you know, in the creating white dwarfs, thanks to the work of amateurs like you, you know, we have data on a system like SS Cygni where we haven't missed a single outburst in well over 100 years by now. We can tell you literally you know, how many outbursts there have been, what their shapes are, how regular they are, irregular they are, what the behavior is. 
you know, at a level of detail that you can only dream of for neutron stars and black holes. And that's just, again, because they're brighter, they erupt much more regularly on time scales that you like. They're just great things to study. If I want to understand how these outbursts work, I should much rather work in the white dwarf case than in the neutron star case. Now, the other thing that's sort of really been interesting and, and where actually things have been led really in some ways from the neutron stars and black holes is that what was realized in the study of, of these objects is that when they outburst, when they, show, when they undergo these outbursts, they do this in a really weird way. And so what they do and the way we, people typically look at this is they plot essentially a color magnitude diagram. They do it in a slightly weird way, but never mind what they plot. What I'm plotting here is, um, so the background picture here is a plot of uh, luminosities of brightness on the, on the y-axis and then uh, the color on the x-axis where the color though is soft, i.e. red as you go to the left. So a bit different from our normal CMD, but same idea. But the point I want you to notice, and I hope you can see my cursor, is that uh, the way an outburst progresses is it starts from down in the bottom right corner and then a system basically brightens and goes straight up. So it stays very hard, very blue while it goes up. Then it goes very quickly across, becomes very soft, okay? And then it stays there for a little while. It then fades down here. It fades while it's still soft and then transitions back to the right and then goes back into quiescence. And the point here is that the thing to take away from this is it doesn't, what you might think is that, you know, even if that, and, and I should explain here what the, the, the reason it gets softer is because in the, on the right-hand side, we think the thing that mostly you're seeing is not even the normal accretion disk, but you're probably just seeing this inner boundary stuff sort of close to the neutron star, the stuff that I said we don't really understand. That emits a lot of this boundary layer, emits a lot of um, X-rays. And so in, in these faint states, it can actually dominate the output. Whereas once it goes into outburst, all you're seeing really is the accretion disk, the just normal accretion disk. And that's the soft component that people talk about. Now, the surprising thing is, so the surprising thing is not really so much that, you know, things start at the bottom left, uh, bottom right, and then go to the top left. The surprising thing is that they don't do that in a diagonal line up and down, right? The surprising thing is that they go up, across, and then down, and then across again, and they don't fall, and they don't even follow the same track. So they go, you know, you go, from the hard to the soft bit, to the disc dominated bit at a much brighter uh, level of, of luminosity than you do on the way back. That was not expected at all. We, we still to this day don't understand why this is happening. Um, and it's what's called in physics in general, hysteresis. Hysteresis just means uh, the path taken up and down something is not the same. And what's really interesting is that we now think that this is quite universal behavior in lots of systems. It's universal, even, even quasars might do this. In quasars, the time scales are way too long for you to see this in, in one system, but people have basically made attempts to study this in different classes. So the idea there is that different classes of, of uh, galaxies and quasars might correspond to, for example, dwarf novae in outburst and dwarf novae in quiescence. And it turns out that there, is some, there seems to be some merit to this. Again, here's a plot that just shows you a sort of similar diagram constructed from different classes of, of active galaxies of quasars. And it seems like it has that sort of characteristic Q shape. So there's a hint that maybe they do exactly the same thing. Um, Associated with this phenomenology is, and what sort of what makes it so interesting <clears throat> is that in the neutron stars, it turns out almost everything about the way accretion works <clears throat> in these objects depends dramatically on. And again, I think my so I'm just going to try and share instead of this. Sorry, excuse me. Just realizing this is just not working right. I'm going to see if I if this is better. I have a version of this, luckily, as a PDF, which might actually, at this point, be 
preferable. Yeah, try this. So let me just see if I can do this. I apologize for this. Okay. Sorry about that. So hopefully that works. Um, so yeah, so it turns out that almost everything depends on where you are in this diagram. So almost everything depends on whether you're in, you know, on the left part of this diagram or on the right part of this diagram. So it turns out, for example, that when people try to track, and so by I should, by the way, say that I'm going to refer occasionally to things like the soft state and the hard state. And by hard state, I just mean essentially the system when it's over here on the right of this diagram and soft just means over here. And you can think of hard and soft simply on whether the accretion disk dominates what's going on or this inner you know, boundaries fluff, hard x-ray emitting fluff that we don't understand at the inner edge of the disk. So, What's turned out to be the case in neutron stars and black holes that we didn't really realize until fairly recently is that everything changes as you go from these into these different states. So it turns out that the variability properties change dramatically. So all of you who study CVs know CVs flicker all the time. So they just random, randomly vary by maybe a few tenths of a magnitude. Well, it turns out all accreting systems do this, but what, what, what we've learned from neutron stars and black holes is that they do this in this sort of very systematic way. So for example, in the hard state, when they're you know, in quiescence and when, they're, um, when this sort of inner fluff dominates, the variability really is at, over here, like at 40% or something like that. So it's very high, high levels of variability. Things really flicker, like, like you know, a few tenths of a magnitude, the equivalent of. But then what happens is systems then go from this hard state into the soft state. And so they, again, they kind of get brighter and then transition over to this left, left side of this hardness intensity diagram, the color magnitude diagram. And so now they're disdominated. And what happens is that they now vary much, much less. They all of a sudden only vary by you know, a few percent. And then they drop while they're over there and then they transition back. And again, key thing to note here is this track by which they uh, traverse this diagram is also hysteretic. So they don't, again, it's not just that the hard and the soft state kind of have different variability properties, but the way they uh, traverse this track is again, different on the way up than on the way down. And again, that's not understood, but it means that Everything is related to this state. Um, I won't, I'll skip this here. We also know that in, in neutron stars and black holes, radio jets uh, are seen only when the system is in the hard state. So when the system is on the, on the right of this diagram, once it becomes dominated by the disk, the jet disappears. Uh, so for those of you who already know dwarf novae, so that would mean yeah, you would see that you wouldn't you wouldn't expect to see a jet when the dwarf nova is an outburst. You would only expect to see the jet when it's in quiescence or maybe on the way up. There is where I've put this little um, uh, red explosion thing. Usually, what actually happens is that as the system gets bright and stays on the hard side, it, the jet, the radio emission, gets brighter and brighter, and then as it crosses over, there's this sort of magic line that sometimes people call the jet line where there's a bright outburst where you make, sometimes you can even see a resolve, you know, blobs moving away from the system, which is like little bits of a jet moving away from the system. And after that, it switches off completely. And so then there's no more emission at all over here. So again, everything seems to be correlated to where you are on the outburst. Also recently recognized is that these disk winds I mentioned, these sort of more tenuous bipolar flows from the surface of the accretion disk. Turns out they seem to be correlated with accretion state. So it turned out that was something that again, only was only realized fairly recently. We see this in high inclination um, black hole systems, for example. So when we look nearly edge on, 
but you only ever see it unlike the jet when the disc when you're in the disc dominated state people haven't really seen it over here in the hard state so people have actually wondered whether this means that jets and disc winds can coexist we now think that's not true but you can see how that's really important that this this idea that literally everything about what's happening in an accretion flow is correlated that all all of these things go hand in hand they all correlate with each other and they behave in quite complicated ways so I haven't gone into too much detail, but what I want to, of course, what I want to finish up with is by showing you that this kind of really complex phenomenology, which is largely not understood. So we, we, we've we gotten very good in the uh, neutron star and black hole community at essentially establishing and measuring this phenomenology. People are, have done phenomenal work at showing in much more detail than I've had time to show you here, like what's really going on there uh, and measure it but we don't understand it. We don't understand what's actually causing it. And of course, that's the holy grail. That's what we'd like to do. So white dwarfs would be fantastic to do this, right? Because as I've said, they're great laboratories. They're nearby, they're easy, fantastic. The worry, and I think that the thing that everybody expected was that they wouldn't show this all this behavior because, well, they're too simple. And so the first step in all of this is to sort of check, well, all this other stuff that I just showed you, do, do white dwarfs, do CVs even show this? Because, you know, if they don't, then it's all just due to, I don't know, relativity or something. And, you know, you can't really learn anything from these things. So here is my attempt to show you how fantastic CVs really are. So first, let's look at this hysteresis thing. Do, when, a, when a CV goes into outburst, when a dwarf nova goes into outburst, does it show hysteresis? Okay. Does it go, does it just go bright and faint? Or does it actually show hysteresis? And SS Cygni, the famous object that many of you probably know and love, is the perfect place to look at this. Now it turns out there's actually remarkably few good data sets on this and something that I'd like to remedy. Uh, but we have at least one or two, and so we can actually look at this. So in this one here, this data set is probably the best one. And uh, Janet Matei from uh, who was an ex-director of the AABSO is, as you see, one of the co-authors on this. And the optical data for this particular project came from the AABSO, of course. And so we have a nice outburst here where we have optical, extreme ultraviolet, and X-ray observations. And so we can look and see whether things are, uh, how they're behaving. So let me start by looking at just optical though, to begin with. Do Dwarf novae, when they undergo outburst, do they display hysteresis? And the answer is they do. And funnily enough, that's been known for an awfully long time, but hadn't really ever been recognized since. Uh, so here is a plot from SS Cygni way back from the 80s. And actually, until very recently, that was literally the best plot there was for, for the color evolution of, uh, of what, the, what, a, um, uh, what a dwarf nova, the color evolution of dwarf nova undergoes during outburst which is a pretty bad plot really. And so what we've recently done, and now I'm gonna to have to just again, just briefly show you a different thing because I've had to switch things around. I apologize for this mess. What we've recently done, I, I got very fed up by this and I wanted to make sure that we could do better because I figured we had to be able to do better um, because after all, the AVSO has taken incredible data for a long time about these things. So how could it possibly be that we can't do better than this? And the answer is, here we go. And the answer is we can do better. I think hopefully you can see this. So just last year, basically, or a couple of years ago, uh, I trawled through the archive of the AVSO and I found a couple of data sets taken by people whose name you might know and love, uh, Josh Hamp and uh, uh, James, Robert James, sorry. Uh, and basically that was an amazing thing because here is what they looked like. So their data sets looked like this and they had multicolor, they had B and V. Um, this is the two outbursts that I found. One, this one is for SS Cygni, this one is for, um, uh, BW Hydri. Uh, in both cases, we had two outbursts here. I've kind of merged them together because the outbursts were remarkably similar. And here is what they looked like when you make a color magnitude diagram out of them. 
And it's really incredible, right? It's, it's hysteretic. It's beautiful hysteresis. You can see how it does, uh, what it does. Um, here's the other one. This is VW Hydri. And then I worked with uh, Jean-Marie uh, Hamari and Jopia Lasota, who are sort of the experts at modeling what disks should be doing during outbursts to see whether they could explain this. And here is their attempt to explain this. And this is the one, this is sort of the one for SS Signy. Here is the one for VW Hydri. And I would say, you know, mixed results. On the one hand, these models do explain the fact that there is hysteresis and there is this kind of behavior. They have, they have, they do display hysteresis. They have the loop in kind of the right direction, but quantitatively agreement isn't great, right? I mean, obviously the colors are not really right. And I would say even the shape of the loops isn't really right. So it kind of, <clears throat> it kind of is from, an, you know, from a phenomenological point of view, uh, and again, let me go back now to my main presentation here. So from a phenological point of view, it's kind of, you know, it's okay. Um, we can kind of understand this, but not really all that well. So now let me go back to my other sharing window. Uh, here we go. <clears throat> And so AIVSO data was absolutely instrumental in this. And I think it's, it's really the state of the art right now that we have, because this kind of data is very difficult for professionals to take. So there's some sort of hints that it's vaguely consistent with theory, but it's not brilliant. <clears throat> what about x-rays? Do x-rays show hysteresis as well? And the answer is yes, they do. We see hysteresis, but it isn't really hysteresis like we see in, um, quite like we see in, in, in black holes and neutron stars. And then really the trouble is that we don't quite know what the right diagram is. If I want to compare a CV to a neutron star or black hole, what should I really be comparing? That's probably been the biggest question that we've been facing with all of this. And there was the best attempt was probably made a few years ago by uh, Elmar Kerding, and I was lucky to be involved in this, where we tried to create a diagram at as best we could, that looked a bit like this Q-shaped diagram in, in neutron stars and black holes. And we found that SS Signy, in fact, using the data set I showed you earlier, it really does look a bit like this. So here's all three types of systems together. And it's really remarkable how similar they look. Unfortunately, today we think maybe that's wrong. Uh, and I don't have time really to go into this, but we, we now think that in some ways this might have been a lucky accident. Uh, really irritating. If you want to know more about this, let me know. Doesn't mean that the behavior is entirely different, but it means that this particular uh, plot is a bit over optimistic. Nevertheless, the fundamental point I want to make is that do these things show hysteresis? Yes, they absolutely do. And quite complex one too. What about variability? Do they show a similar kind of variability? And the answer is yes. In fact, what I'm showing you here is two light curves, right, on the right. And I would say you couldn't tell the difference between these. This is, this is just flickering light curves. If in the top, you see a white dwarf. In the optical, in the bottom, you see a black hole in x-rays. And you know they're, they're identical. The time scales are different. But if you didn't know that, you would just say they're the same kind of system. And so again, flickering seems to be very much the same. In fact, even qualitatively, it turns out that flickering follows some really detailed uh, behavior. Flickering sees sort of, to an observer probably sounds kind of boring. But actually, flickering is fascinating. It turns out that all accreting systems do this, and we don't really understand completely why. One thing they do is that flickering, the strength of flickering, has a linear relationship with how bright the system is. So it turns out that if you simply measure the scatter in your light curve when the system is bright, what you'll find is that that scatter will be much larger when it's bright than when it's faint which is really something that sounds perhaps silly, but it turns out it rules out a whole class of models for this. And it turns out all systems look the same. Here are three are black holes, neutron stars, and AGN. Uh, and I won't go into this, but then recently, Simon Escarinji showed that CVs do exactly the same thing. Bottom panel here is, again, this relationship between variability level and, and brightness, perfectly linear, exactly the same. And again, I'll skip this. Uh, in fact, even quasi-periodic oscillations, we see a lot of oscillations in neutron stars and black holes, again, origin of which is not always understood, but it turns out that we see similar oscillations in, in dwarf novae. In fact, some of you might know that we see things like dwarf novae, no, 
dwarf nova oscillations. Now, it turns out in the neutron stars, it was realized some time ago, in black holes, I should say, that different types of oscillations correlated with each other. So if you looked at two types of these oscillations and plot their frequency against the other type of oscillation, it's a perfect straight line. And that's what I'm showing you here. Well, it was also then realized not too, lo not too long after that, that if you put CVs on top of this, they just followed the same line. They just extended to even lower frequencies. So again, the behavior seems to be exactly the same. And I'm going to sort of, just to finish off, I'm going to just briefly talk about outflows for the last couple of minutes. I mentioned earlier that perhaps the most controversial thing you might think CVs shouldn't be able to do is launch jets. And that's just because we think jets probably require something like maybe the spin of a black hole or strong gravity or something. And people had looked for jets in CVs for quite a while, but they really looked in the wrong way. And I kind of made the point earlier that, you know, in uh, black hole systems and neutron star systems, the jet is only there when the system is on sort of the right half of the diagram and it's in the so-called hard state. But that, this, but that these jets then switch off once it gets too bright. And that there's this bright flare when it's sort of somewhere when it crosses from like this hard state over here to the soft state over here. So the obvious best place to find these jets is when during this flare. And that was what was really realized by Elmar Kerding only in 2008. Um, and what he did is basically say, well, look, if jets exist in CEVs, that's the moment you should look. And to make that happen, to make that check happen, we needed the AVSO again, because what that meant is we had to catch a dwarf nova with radio observations within about 24 hours, or actually more like 12 hours of an outburst starting. And none of us could really do that. We needed amateurs to just monitor the system, tell us, okay, outburst is happening now. And then we had to immediately trigger radio observations. So we did that. And sure enough, we found a huge radio flare in the system the very first attempt we managed. And again, amateur astronomers were critical to make that happen. And that was a really big deal because it immediately ruled out, right, that you know, all this stuff about you know, black hole spin being the critical you know, thing to make jets happen. Well, clearly that's not true because you know, CVs can do it. I'm going to skip this quiz here because I think I'm running out of time. If you want to ask me about this, feel free, but so I'm just to finish then, really what I've been trying to show you is that what's remarkable is that all disk accreting systems, and this includes CVs, and CVs are easy by comparison to neutron stars and black holes, but all of them seem to show just such remarkable uh, similarities. Everything from the fact that they do display outbursts to the hysteresis these outbursts show, to whether or not they have jets or disk winds, to the variability they produce. Everything seems to be sort of the same, scaled versions of the same, and they behave in very much the same way. So what that suggests is that the accretion physics that drives all of this, the way in which accretion disk works, really is universal. It's the same in all of these systems. And it doesn't even require you know, ultra strong magnetic fields as you might expect from neutron stars or strong gravity and, gravi and, and general relativity, as you might expect from black holes, those things might be added bonuses in some, in some settings. But the fundamental way in which accretion works seems to be the same everywhere. And for understanding that, for understanding the basic physics of accretion, there just isn't anything better than CVs. And we now think that understanding that in CVs would tell us about all of these things in all of these objects. So that's why I'm really quite excited these days to really try to do more campaigns to understand accretion in CVs better, because I think that's really the way forward if you want to turn phenomenology into physics, which is really what we should be doing at this point. And with that, I'm going to stop, and I apologize for all these technical issues, which I, which I really hate to have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mugge. That was excellent. All right. Uh, we've had a couple of great questions already come in. So let's get started with the Q&A. Um, so the first question comes from Timothy Weaver, who has asked, uh, on Earth, particulate matter can build up an electrical charge like lightning from clouds. Would electrical charges also build up in an accretion disk and have a visible effect? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. And the answer is that in accretion disks, 
Um, in, in fact, in pretty much all of these systems, the, the typical temperatures you would encounter are sort of on the order of a few thousand degrees to a, you know, more like tens of thousands of degrees, something like that. Um, and one thing that does mean is that, that a lot of electrons are stripped from, from, their, from their atoms. Um, most of what you see is basically fairly highly ionized stuff. Even hydrogen is mostly ionized, certainly in, in most cases. Um, so you might think, therefore, there's lots of charges floating around that basically do lots of interesting things. But this stuff is basically behaving like a gas. And so net, the net effect is everything is kind of neutral. Um, all that said, there are some ideas for how this might matter. And certainly magnetic fields can matter. And I've kind of ignored this here. And of course, for magnetic fields, then charged particles are critical to make, you know, to, well, Magnetic fields can essentially guide the motion of charged particles. They have to be charged. So there, that's an example of something where the charges really do make a difference. And I've kind of glossed over this a bit here. Um, but so not, I would say the way in which this matters is sort of different from the way it matters in the example described. So we don't really think that charges accumulate in quite the same way. Uh, but the fact that they are charges and the fact that they are free electrons floating around, for example, does make a difference to some physics. Okay, thank you. Um, sp okay, speaking about magnetic fields, our next question comes from uh, Chuck Orvik, who asked if the strength of the magnetic field of the white dwarf is determined by the mass of the progenitor star or something mm -hmm. else. Again, excellent question. Truth is, nobody really knows. Um, it's, it's, it's actually a bit of a mystery. Uh, CVs are really interesting because from them, we, in many cases, we can measure the strengths of these fields. And we know that in, I, I didn't give numbers in actual, of actual strengths, but for those of you who might know about this, so that sort of this dividing line between what's weak and what's strong, like where does it matter? It's probably around, I don't know, 100 um, mega gauss or something like that, uh, something like that maybe. Um, but it's still mega gauss, this region, so quite strong already. But the thing is, the range of, um, sorry, a few megagauss, not 100 megagauss, that's, that's too strong. But the range of, um, of fields we see is huge. We see in weak, you know, weak fields are probably less than 100,000, and then they go up by at least a factor of, I don't know, 1,000 or 10,000. It's just not clear how that works. What determines the strengths of this field? Mm -hmm. um, it probably, in, in most cases, it probably is to do with the progenitor. But what determines it is not at all clear. Is it rotation? Is it something else? Um, there, there are thoughts that at least the very strong field ones might all have to do, might all have been objects that actually merged already. Um, so they actually didn't start, that they, those did, might have not have even started life as single objects that became white dwarfs, but maybe they already merged white dwarfs. But, in truth, this is not understood. Uh, and I think that field of like what determines the magnetic field strengths of, of white dwarfs, I think is not, it's not clear because the variety is, is, is much larger than you might immediately expect, I think. Interesting. Sounds like a case for more observations to me. Yes. All right. So uh, we got a couple questions here about uh, CV jets. So yeah. first of all, uh, what would a CV jet look like in the optical band if it was pointing directly at the observer? Oh, that's, an, again, excellent question. I, I think the answer is nothing, although it's an interesting question. It's a good question, like what it would look at directly at the observer. I think probably still nothing. Uh, and the reason is that these jets are, they're probably important in lots of different ways, but, but they are quite um, what we call optically thin. So they're quite, you can basically see right through them. Um, and they emit mostly synchrotron radiation. So in fact, they emit radiation where the, for, to do with uh, electrons spiraling around field lines. And all that is pretty much coming out of radio wavelengths. Um, so not very much actually happens in the optical, we think. Uh, in, in black holes and neutron stars, sometimes uh, you can see things leaking out into maybe the infrared or something like that. But in CVs, I, I don't think there's much of a hope of seeing them optically. It would be, I'd love it if we could, but I don't think there's any hope. Good answer, thank you. Our other question about jets uh, is why do, why do they form and emerge out of CVs? <laughs> that, that again, 
million dollar questions. I mean, I, nobody has a clue. I mean, in fact, jet formation in general is just not understood. Jet formation, even in, in neutron, again, in black holes and neutron stars, people have, there, there's a few models out there that people understand, and, well, understand theoretically, doesn't mean that they're necessarily right in, in nature. But, you know, again, one of, the, you know, a very, uh, a very um, popular model, for example, exploits the, the spin of a black hole to launch a jet, essentially. It extracts energy from the spin of the black hole. What CVs seem to show, and I have to be a bit careful here, I'm kind of, I don't want to oversell this, right? I mean, we, we do see radio emission. We're, we're increasingly sure that in CVs, when we do see these radio things, that they are jets. Um, so that's good, and I really think that means something. But we have to be careful, right, that doesn't necessarily mean that the mechanisms for launching them are exactly the same. There could be more than one mechanism. Mm -hmm. That said, if they are the same and if the phenology is very much the same, it does suggest that maybe, maybe in black holes and neutron stars, it isn't those mechanisms because you can't, you know, you can't do that in CVs. CVs do not have the spin energy like that that you can extract via that mechanism. Um, so actually, I think jet formation is, is something, it turns, so the reason I should say why jet formation is so difficult as well is because it probably involves a whole host of horrific physics. I mean, good physics, of course, but horrific in how complicated it is. So the sort of simulations people have to do in which you try to predict how the jet forms can involve a huge range of scales. Uh, that's already really bad. And they, have, they also in, involve a huge range of physics. In black holes, for example, you really have to then include you know, general relativity, usually radiation pressure, usually all, you know, all kinds of other things. And it becomes just very difficult. Actually, that's one of the reasons, again, as I say, why I think CVs have such promise as, as laboratories, because you can ignore a lot of that stuff. In mm -hmm. CVs, you can pretty much just say, look, no, it's a white dwarf. <laughs> you know, we know how white dwarfs work. You have to find a way to make that little system launch a jet. And that might be sort of the clue, I think, that we need to make progress. But at the moment, we genuinely don't know. And in CVs, we probably have, we, I don't think we have any model of how this might work in CVs other than maybe via order of magnetic fields. Um, and then it just basically pushes, pushes the ball one further bit on and, you know, why are, the, why are there order of magnetic fields? <laughs> so. Well, that's very interesting. And again, a, a case for more observations. Yeah. Now, um, our next question is coming from Patrick Cavanaugh, who has asked uh, in CVs, the magnitudes change during accretion cycles. What about the spectra? Do you see these change during outbursts? Yes. Again, great question. And the answer is yes, you absolutely do. Um, essentially in, in CVs, when they're faint, uh, their spectra tend to be um, relatively cool, um, but most importantly, they tend to have huge emission lines. And the emission lines are happening in that state because roughly speaking, at least, there are parts of the disk that are optically thin. Again, you can see through it essentially. And that seems to be, you know, essentially to make emission lines happen, you, you kind of want something like that. And you want what's called a temperature inversion. Essentially what you want is to have something cool behind something hot. And in, in, in quiescence, these disks are kind of weird and they, they do that naturally. Actually, the funny thing is quiescent disks are harder to understand actually than outbursting disks. Outbursting disks are much more like what we, you know, what our normal theories of disks say disks should be like. Um, and in fact, when they go into outbursts, what tends to happen is they become much more like that, like you naively expect, which is to say these emission lines tend to go away for the most part. Um, and the spectra end up looking a lot more like black bodies, uh, like a stretched black body, which is kind of what you might think. So black body meaning like, you know, it's just thermal emission from a hot thing. Uh, and so they change pretty dramatically uh, as you go through outbursts going from these extremely strong emission line sources to much more either absorption line or, you know, sometimes slight emission line things, but very different. And again, we do see in the, if you look in the ultraviolet, you see winds developing, which, which we never see in the low state and we always practically see in the high state. So yeah, everything changes. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I've discovered that black body bit for myself. First time I shot a CV in outburst, uh, taking spectra and uh i was a little bit disappointed that there were none of the cool emission lines yeah no, it, they, they it just sure is it's it the sure transition. Is. It, what's fascinating is the transition uh and and that is i mean in fact that 
if it, it, uh, amateurs could have a real role to play here too, I would say. Mm -hmm. There aren't a lot of data sets where we have actually tracked the spectroscopy through an outburst cycle on the rise, mm -hmm. on the decline, because it's very difficult for professionals to do. Like we ask for observing time and then we get observing time on a particular night. Nothing like, nothing's probably going to happen that night. So you just get whatever you get. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you guys can actually say, no, I'm going to sit on this thing and I'm going to make sure that when it goes into outburst, I'm going to get spectra all the way up. We don't actually know, for example, exactly when the emission lines go away. Mm -hmm. Like, do the emission lines go away at a time that is related to anything else? You know, is it related to when, I don't know, winds appear in the ultraviolet or something like that? We don't know. And, and amateurs, I think, have a real chance to, to make a difference there now that spectroscopy is becoming so common. That's, that's very good to know. Thank you for saying that. All right. Uh, so we're almost out of time for questions, but we do have a couple interesting ones still queued up. So let's try and get just some quick answers out. Yep. Um, so Chuck Orovec had asked about disk winds. Can you talk briefly about their importance to the overall physics of the system? Yeah. Um, again, like many things kind of unknown, we, we think that probably what drives them, the most likely mechanism is actually radiation pressure. So photons from the disk hitting particles and pushing them out, literally. Mm -hmm. um, but there are, there are, and if that's the case, then dynamically, they're probably not super important. We think that the amount of mass you lose is maybe 10% of the amount that's trying to accrete. So not negligible, but not huge. Um, that said, there are different models in which essentially accretion can only proceed because of outflows. So essentially what happens there is that it's really, there isn't really, normally we think accretion happens because you have sort of turbulent friction in the disk that allows things to spiral in slowly. But another way in which you can do it is actually by having the outflow carry away all the angular momentum as it were. So essentially you, you instead of, instead of having friction in the disk, you kind of use the outflow as friction. Um, if that's the case, and I don't think it is, but if that were the case, then accretion could only proceed because of the outflows. And actually understanding what, and for this, one of the goal, you know, holy grails is really understanding what is driving the outflows. Is it radiation pressure? Is it magnetic fields? Is it something else? Because once we know that, then we can actually say, okay, they matter in this way, but not this way. Um, at the moment, we, it's not clear. Interesting. That seems to be my refrain, by the way. I am. Uh, the answer seems to most questions seems to be, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Uh, two more questions, and then we're going to move on to the next presenter. Um, so first question, what do you think could be the reason behind flickering? Is it uh, a change in mass transfer rate, a change in uh, disk, viscosity, disk viscosity? Yeah, again, great question. We think that the best model that's out there for this is that it's what's happening is essentially uh, slight changes in the in the accretion rate locally in in the disk, so that you can sort of think of it like make it think of a disk as made up of lots of little annuli, and essentially each annulus isn't going to be perfectly you know steadily transporting the same amount of mass from its outer edge to its inner edge. It's just because everything is kind of stochastic; it kind of does it with a little bit of variations, mm -hmm. and the idea is that those things essentially add up. Uh, that the outer ones do it on a very slow time scales, the inner ones do it on a very fast time scales, and what comes out at the end has all manner of time scales on it. And that's that's the basic idea. And that it has merit. So for example, this flux, I meant I showed this brightness uh, variability correlation, which is remarkably linear. And that model, for example, predicts that, which is kind of right. nice. Um, so that's the that's the best bet right now. Interesting. All right, uh, our last question comes from Vera Gudanova, who has asked, what is the future of these systems, their end state? Ah, okay, great question. Um, different kinds of states, actually. The, most of them, what will probably happen to them is, is that the, sec you know, the secondary basically keeps losing mass. It's actually really interesting. What, one thing I should say is that I love these systems partly because you know, one of the common mistakes people make about normal stars is that they, you know, when people learn first about the main sequence of stars, normal hydrogen burning stars, when you plot that, a lot of people initially think that stars evolve along the main sequence. And of course they, they don't really, right? A star just sits at some location there and then turns off it and goes, becomes a giant. Well, CVs do. <laughs> CV secondary stars, you literally keep taking mass away. They literally evolve down the main sequence, basically. And they go from a normal, I don't know, 0.6 solar mass star to something close to a normal, you know, brown dwarf eventually. 
Now, what happens at the very end is, is, is actually, nobody knows, again, it's one of these huge questions. Like, do they end up, um, we know that we know some systems that have brown dwarf companions. We don't know what happens after that. Like, do they ultimately evaporate those things or do they just sort of gradually fade away? Um, we know the accretion rate gets lower and lower when that happens and that makes them actually very hard to find. Um, so these guys get very faint um, very quickly down there. Um, so that's the majority of systems. But there are some other systems that might, for example, become supernovae um, if they accrete very fast. If the white dwarf accretes, accretes at a sufficiently high rate, then you can actually push it over the Chandrasekhar limit, the sort of maximum mass for a white dwarf, and then they can actually explode a supernovae. So that's another possibility. Um, those are probably the two most interesting ones, I think. All right. Thank you. Great answer. All right. Uh... Now I have a comment that I just want to read out that came in from Elizabeth Wagon, who said, thank you very much for your fascinating presentation. And when you're ready for your next observing campaign, just let us know and the AVSO will be more than happy to participate. I always do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, if you can go ahead and close your screen share out real quick. I will um, do. Thank you. And hold on while I go to the participants window. Thank you, Christian. Right. Oh, thanks. Hey, Bye. All right. So um, next up, we're going to be hearing about spectroscopy from Francois Cochard, who is coming to us all the way from France. Francois is an amateur astronomer and the co-founder of Sheliac Instruments. He's had a major hand in the production of most of the astronomical spectrographs in use by amateurs today, including the El High Res 3, the Alpi 600, and the UVEX. So to say that he's an expert on spectrographic instrumentation would be putting it very mildly. Luckily for us, he also has lots of experience teaching as the organizer of the world's premier spectroscopic star party and a frequent presenter at other educational events, including SMSW2, which was the predecessor of the AAVSO spectroscopy workshop and also the event that got me into spectroscopy. <laughs> well, uh, that's enough out of me. So Francois, take it away. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, hi to everybody. Well, I will share my screen, of course. I'm, I'm very happy to be with you. Well, in, in this strange time, uh, it's, it's great to, to have this opportunity to, to talk to you. I've quickly looked at the list of the attendees. I know some of you, so uh, to all the people I know, I say, hey, hello, guys. And I'm very happy to see that, uh, uh, that there will be a, a lot of new friends uh, thanks to the AVSO uh, today. And that, that's really great. So I think uh, I, will, I will talk about spectroscopy. And uh, my idea, I, I think that most of you uh, are uh, just new to spectroscopy, to practical spectroscopy, I mean. And then uh, I will try to answer this question. So if you want to jump into spectroscopy, so which hardware do you, uh, do you need to, to, to do which observations? Okay, so this is, uh, this is my idea tonight. And, uh, and, and of course, you will ask uh, as many questions as you want. Okay. Um, I would, I'd like to say, well, the, the agenda is very uh, uh, basic. Uh, we, we'll talk, I, I'll talk very briefly about spectroscopy. Uh, I, I do consider that you, you, you know roughly what it is. And, and then uh, I will just have a, a quick uh, a one picture uh, story. And uh, then uh, I'd like to go to uh, the main keys, I think, uh, to, to choose or select which kind of uh, in, uh, hardware you, uh, or instruments you need to do spectroscopy. So the first one is uh, your personal goal. The second one is the technical constraints uh, that you may face uh, with spectroscopy. Of course, the, the third one is your budget, and, and this one is obvious. And uh, I, I will uh, finish by uh, talking about uh, two newcomers uh, in the instruments uh, landscape, uh, uh, which are the, the UVEX and also the Solex uh, instruments. I think uh, these are very interesting uh, instruments. Okay, so um, uh, let's talk about spectroscopy. Um, I like the idea to do it in what picture? Here is the picture. I guess that um, uh, you are familiar with this kind of uh, image. Uh, it, it was taken a few years ago with a very basic DSLR. Uh, and and uh, it is in, in the constellation of the Cygnus. 
it is in the Milky Way, so of course it is very cloudy. Uh, and and when you are doing imaging or um, you know, even photometry, you, you can see this kind of uh, of uh, landscape of uh, image. Now, uh, when we are doing spectroscopy, we are not uh, looking at at all these stars like this, but we could be interested in one given star. For instance, this one, this small one here, uh, uh, closer to to the cursor here. And uh, and maybe because this one is a, a, a variable star, and this is something that I want to to tell you, especially uh, you, the AVSO members, is that you have to understand that with the spectroscopy, you will not only find that some stars are variable, which is of course the the, the main uh, activity of the AVSO, but you will uh, you will overwork on. Um, understanding why they vary and this is something which is really it gives a new dimension uh, to the uh, uh, to your observations and, and to the uh, to the knowledge we have about uh, all these stars so this is really um, uh, doing spectroscopy is for me very very natural uh, for you uh, the AVSO members okay so when we are doing spectroscopy uh, we are just uh, uh, observing this specific star, and we are not uh, uh, taking it as a point, but we are spreading out the light uh, of this star and uh, along uh, a line. So we, we use a spectroscope that uh, spreads out uh, the light, uh, and, and then you'll, you'll, the, the, the point is uh, replaced, uh, is transformed by a line which gives the intensity of the spectrum uh, versus the uh, wavelengths. Okay, so it 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 converts uh, the, the 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 spectrum in the geometry uh, on your sensor, and during the acquisition, during the night when you are uh, on your telescope, you will see uh, this uh, this kind of image. Uh, you will see a line instead of a, a point, or, uh, as you used to do it. And then after that, you have a second step, which is where, that we call the data reduction, which consists to extract the information from this image and to convert it in a, a profile like this one. Well, by the way, uh, this this uh, spectrum, this 2D spectrum, is not the same uh, as the, the profile that I show here, because we, we can see uh, two uh, big, uh, deep uh, absorption lines here that are not present here. But this is just uh, to, to give an example. And the, the, your job as an observer is to convert, to do the observation, and then to convert it uh, to this uh, to this kind of profile in which you have the, the, the wavelengths uh, on the x-axis and the relative intensity uh, in, in the y-axis. Okay, and this is something in, in very important. Uh, it, 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 the, 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 the point is that we have to, uh, to clean up uh, this profile, to, to uh, clean up all the information that we extract from the uh, to the image to make sure that you only keep uh, the uh, scientific information coming from the star. And of course, we have a lot of uh, instrumental effects that we have to take into account. For instance, we have to uh, wavelengths calibrate uh, the, the, uh, the spectrum to, to make sure that um, the, the, the information we give here is accurate, OK? And by the way, also something important to keep in mind is that in a spectrum, you really have to access one is the the uh, wavelength axis and um, th this axis is very important when you want to um, well to identify uh, some lines of course and also when you want to to play with the doppler effect so which is a signature of the um, radial velocities uh, uh, from the object and then when, when you want to measure radial velocity you will look mainly at uh, the the x axis okay and then you'll have to be very uh, precise in the wavelength calibration now the second axis is when you want to know for instance um, uh, what is the general profile of your spectrum or is uh, this kind of line uh, this uh, given uh, lines absorption or emission line from a given element is present or not in, in the spectrum uh, then you, you look at the intensity or you can also measure the relative intensities of two lines absorption or emission again okay so this when you have to 
work on this uh, y-axis and, and look at the intensities uh, with with, the, uh, with high precision, then you'll have to be very careful with the the, um, the 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 response curve correction and making sure of the relative intensity is is correct and is accurate. Okay. So, but yeah, really, you, using this kind of spectrum, you can do a lot of things uh, from, from this kind of profile. You can talk about uh, Doppler effect, you can talk about uh, chemics, you can talk about physics, and, and, and so on. Okay, so the, uh, it, it's important for the, for the next step, I think. Now, uh, the first key, I think, the, the most important is, what is your personal goal when you want to jump into spectroscopy? I think that the, the, for me, there are two categories <laughs> of people, the, the one uh, who knows uh, what, what they want to do and, and people that they, they don't specially want, know what they, they want to do. They just want to discover spectroscopy and, and that's it. In fact, uh, for sure, if you want to define what is the best configuration, it's better to know what kind of observation you can do. Because if you know what you want to, to observe, then we, we can discuss about what are uh, the, the key parameters uh, for, for your instrument. But there is a lot of people who just want to know how it works and uh, what what you can really uh, observe, what you can really see with your instruments, and and then you and, and you are curious and you want to see about to to, to look at all the different uh, objects that you have you are in you have in, in the sky, and, and then you you have no specific uh, uh, area in which you want to observe. Um, well, by the way, if you if you don't specially know about the uh, the, the, the kind of observation I want to do, my recommendation is that you, you should start with a low resolution instrument, okay, because it is, uh, it is simpler, it is uh, easier, it is, um, you, you'll have uh, shorter exposure times and so on. Now, if you know what you want to do, uh, you have few questions to ask yourself. So, what is the resolution that I need? And I will show you some, some figures later on. Uh, the resolution is the ability to see details okay, in your spectrum. So to see really some physical uh, informations in, in your spectrum. And uh, this, is, this is like in, in photo, you, you may have a, a wide angle uh, 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 lens, or you, you could have a, a tele lens and depending on what you want to do. And keep in mind that it's obvious if you can see more details, uh, it's, it's always better, of course, but there is a drawback to the high resolution. If you, are, if you have a high resolution, it means that the, the, the total bandwidth of your spectrum will be smaller. So if you need to have a wide uh, 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 wavelength uh, domain, then it's better to have a low resolution. Okay, you, you, you know what I mean? And the, the, so there is another, another criteria that you have to keep in mind is that with low resolution, you will, you will put, um, uh, how can I say that? Uh, each pixel of your camera will receive more light, a, a, a larger um, a bandwidth, spectral bandwidth, and then it will receive more then energy. And this, then uh, the, the, as a result, the exposure time will be lower, will be shorter. And this is very important because if you are talking very roughly, if you are talking about low resolution, uh, you will talk about observations of few seconds or minutes. If you are talking about high resolution, you'll be talking maybe about hours. Okay, so it will be, it will make uh, easier observations, which is important. And, and if you want to be more productive, it, all will, it all also means that during one night, you will be able to do much more observations in low resolution than in high resolution with a given telescope, of course. Okay, the second point that you, you have to, to look, uh, the second parameter that you look, have to look at is the, the magnitude of, my, of your, your target. Um, of course, if you want to observe very faint targets, uh, you, you, uh, it will take more time, or you will need a, a bigger telescope, of course, to, to catch more light. And really, this is something which is uh, very important. And of course, uh, well, I always recommend to start with the bright targets, for sure, at least to, to, to make, uh, to, to be comfortable with your instrument and to, to put your instrument under control. 
but the, if you if you have some uh, um, uh, goal, uh, a scientific goal which is really dedicated to faint targets, uh, then it, it it may be it will be very probably the, the the critical parameter. And again, here if you keep in mind that you will always go fainter in magnitude, you, you will go get uh, fainter targets if you are working in low resolution than in a high resolution. Okay, so there, there is a, a kind of uh, a trade-off to find between the high and, and the, the resolution and the magnitude. Another question is, of course, uh, uh, what is uh, the, the spectral domain you want to cover? So there is the, 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 the size of the, the, the spectral domain, but there is also the, the in which uh, area do you want to observe in the UV, in the visible, in the uh, infrared, or, well, I, I don't talk, I'm not talking about the X-rays, <laughs> like the, the uh, uh, like uh, Dr. Knigge before, but the, the uh, today we, we can really observe from, from UV uh, to uh, infrared, to near infrared, and, and it depends on what you are looking for. Uh, and some instruments can cover all the, the, uh, the areas, some cannot, and, and especially with the, the UVX, I will talk about the UVX in, in a few minutes, uh, which is a new instrument, uh, it will, will open uh, new doors uh, to extreme uh, areas uh, like the uh, UV and the uh, IR, the infrared. Okay, so you have to look at the, this, this particular domain. Generally speaking, um, uh, there is a lot of things uh, to observe in the visible range. And the, of course, the blue end is uh, more for the high energy and the, um, and the, the, uh, the, the red hand and the infrared is more for the code material, of course, and all what is uh, uh, interstellar material and uh, all what is the, the molecular uh, information and things like that. So um, really, when you are talking about uh, UV, uh, optical or visible range or infrared, uh, these are uh, different physics uh, field uh, that are behind. Okay. Uh, last point is uh, the, uh, some very basic things, but uh, how long the phenomenon that you want to observe will last. Um, there are some phenomena in, in the sky that are very fast. When I'm thinking, for instance, uh, about uh, our early eye star, uh, during the, the, um, um, the, the maximum of the, 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 the maximum effect uh, of these stars, uh, the, the, the profile and, and the, 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 the evolution of the spectrum is so fast that we, we consider that your observation must not be more than five minutes because in, in more than in 10 or 15 minutes, you will the, the phenomenon that you observe will change in, in this uh, period. So it will give a very high constraints of your observation. Of course, there is a lot of uh, phenomena that, 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 least, that last for years or decades or well, uh, even days. In, in this case, you can, you, you, it's not that constrainful. So you can observe for one hour, two, hour, two hours without any problem. Keep in mind that if you have a, 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 a timing uh, criteria, a timing constraints, it, it has to be taken into account when you choose your instrument. Okay. Also, uh, keep in mind that there is no ideal and universal instrument. So, even if you give me uh, millions of dollars, I'm not able, and nobody is able to make uh, the ideal uh, instrument. So, uh, the, the 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 best instruments always depend of your observation or your scientific goal. So, if you if you tell me what kind of observation you want to do, I, I can help you to select the instrument and to to uh, help you to to find the, the best configuration. But uh, if you just tell me, well, I just want to do spectroscopy. I really uh, think that the best is you 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 take uh, I would say middle range instrument something that that is as universal as possible, but it will be probably not optimal for all kind of observation. Okay.
the the and again uh, I repeat uh, if you don't know exactly what kind of observation you want to do really go to low resolution because you you'll see all the landscapes of all the instruments all the um, targets that you have in you you can have in stars and, and you'll you'll much better have a general view of uh, what is in the sky now the the some illustration uh, when i'm talking about uh, low resolution this is this kind of of spectrum where you go from the blue to the red in this case it is uh, this is a very very low uh, very old observation and uh, you 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 can see the wool visible range okay and so this is a hot stars with the balmer lines here and you you can see the uh, atmospheric lines uh, at the end and, and this is something which is very familiar you have the ha line which is the most important uh, because this is the most important uh, line in the uh, hydrogen uh, spectrum and the hydrogen is the most important uh, element in the universe so you always have this uh, this uh, uh, line which is in the red in the far red uh, not in the far red in the visible uh, red the, the uh, uh, its wavelength is uh, 656 nanometer and uh, in this case uh, you you can see the wool range and when we're talking about high resolution we'll, we'll have a kind of zoom on this uh, line and in this case you will see here you just see a small absorption line and you cannot see a lot of details and here you can see a lot of details and you can even see additional lines by the way this way these lines are telluric lines so by telluric i mean uh, th these are lines that are in the earth's atmosphere and and, uh, and and they are very uh, useful to calibrate <laughs> uh, the, the the spectrum in the region of the uh, h alpha and and, um, and and this case you can also see the detail of the profile of the line okay but again in this case uh, you can see the details but you cannot see uh, the the, the um, uh, as big domain as uh, you would in low resolution okay and the, this graph beside is uh, this is just a, a screen copy of um, of a the uh, aras beam uh, database uh, so the aras beam database is a database managed by the amateurs and to to track uh, this the uh, be stars and to uh, uh, collect uh, spectra about the be star so the aras beam tool is dedicated to um, the amateurs and it is uh, closely linked to the base database which is the professional database in which uh, any uh, contributor can can upload uh, their observation. I have just taken here to, to give you an example. Uh, this is the same star, same star uh, for Hercules. I think we say Hercules, and the the this is the H alpha line. So we we can see it. We are close to the 656 nanometers, and uh, uh, in these two cases, so the dates are almost the same. It was in March uh, 2020, and uh, we have two different instruments and this one was uh, taken by Olivier Tizier in France I think if I'm right here he uses um, well both of them the other one is from Stephen Charbonnel uh, both of them I think are using uh, the Echel uh, instrument yes this is the Echel so the same instrument but one has a C11 telescope and the, the Stefan has a bigger much bigger telescope which is of um, uh, 500 centimeters uh, telescope Scopes. And the other point is that here he did an exposure of uh, uh, more than one hour, where uh, Olivier did an exposure of half an hour. And the result is immediate. So you have a better uh, signal to noise ratio. Okay, so this is uh, they, they, they do have the same instruments or the same resolution, the same the same kind of uh, of data, but in one case you have a much better signal to noise ratio. And if you look, for instance, to this region, you can see details here that are much more difficult to analyze, and and they are 
they are less, much less precise uh, in this region. So depending on what kind of information you, you need, you'll have to take care of the, what we call the signal to noise ratio. And so the, 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 the fact that you, you can uh, detect precisely uh, the signal uh, out, of the, uh, the, 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 out of the noise. And, and of course, the more uh, you will expose, uh, the, the better will be the result. And of course, if you, if you have a bigger telescope, uh, you'll also um, have a better result. OK. Now, uh, the, the, so the, this was uh, the, the first point. The, the first point is really wh what you want to observe and wh what is your scientific goal. Um, I, I like to say that the spectroscopy, uh, well, this is a technical activity, but if we do that, this is really to do observation, observations and, and then to do science uh, with uh, these uh, uh, instruments. So uh, tonight, like very often, I'm talking about techniques, but these techniques is really dedicated to do hands behind. Okay, so the the, the most important um, uh, input for you is what kind of science you want to do. Okay, now uh, let's look at some technical constraints regarding the instruments, which is the second key uh, when you want to select an instrument. Very generally speaking, we have three kinds of instruments. We have the slitless spectroscope, we have the slit spectroscope, and we also have the fiber fed spectroscope. Uh, the, 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 they, are, they do have many, uh, um, almost the same general architecture, but there are some, some important uh, differences uh, for your, uh, your, your application. I, I will go to the, the I will show some pictures uh, behind regarding uh, this kind of uh, system. So the slitless, slitless is the simplest for sure, and the fiber thread is probably the, the more complex. And, and, uh, and, and by the way, most of the professional instruments uh, today are fiber fed spectroscope because of the size of the instrument. This is uh, something important when you when, when you want to start in, in spectroscopy, the, the, this is a key question. Do you already have a, a telescope? If you have the telescope, uh, please keep it and use it. So don't wait for uh, another one and, and start by using your own telescope. And just beware that the bigger the telescope, for a given resolution, the bigger telescope, the bigger the spectrum. Okay, so this is for optical reasons. Uh, I, I don't want to spend too much time here to, to ask you uh, to, to um, uh, give you all the details, but maybe we, we can uh, talk about that during the discussion. But really, for a given resolution, if you have a one meter telescope, the, tel the spectroscope will be big. If you have uh, an eight inch uh, telescope, uh, your spectroscope for the same resolution will be uh, much smaller. So. The, the, the good news is that, uh, generally speaking, in the amateur's world, we are using small telescopes. So it means that we can afford to use small spectroscopes. And we are lucky to do that. And this is why we can do very good, very high quality observations with our small uh, instruments. OK, so don't think, please don't think that you need to have a big telescope uh, to, to do spectroscopy. If you don't already have the telescope and you want to buy uh, or make uh, the, the uh, uh, a telescope uh, to start in spectroscopy, uh, I think that today you should prefer to have a purely mirror telescopes. So it means uh, either a uh, Newton telescope or a uh, richer um, uh, Cartesian telescope, an RC telescope, or maybe a Cassegrain. Uh, not a schmidt Casgrain, a pure Casgrain telescope, which is also a purely mirror telescope. Why? For a very simple reason. Uh, when you have a purely uh, mirror telescopes, you have absolutely no chromatism. So it means that there is the, 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 the optics is exactly the same at any wavelength. As soon as you put glass in the light pass, you make a chromatism, which means, which means that you will not have exactly the same focal point for the, the, the blue or the UV and for the red or the, or the infrared. And that makes something complex to, to have a wide field uh, instrument. And especially, uh, I already uh, told you that we, are, um, we, we, can, we see some new instruments like the UVEX. And with this instrument, we can go very far in the UV and in the UR compared to what we did before. 
Uh, and then it's important to use uh, this kind of telescopes. Okay. Really, it, this is what gives uh, the best. But again, uh, if you start, just start with what you have and, and you don't need to have a new telescope to do that. It's only a question of optimization. So start with some, uh, what you have and then uh, with the experience, you, you'll see if you, if you need uh, to improve uh, this setup. Um, another uh, important point is that you, you have uh, most of the time you have to use a guiding module. Guiding module means that you have to have a system. Again, I will show you some pictures behind. Um, the, the, you, you have to, to, to have a system to make sure that you are observing and tracking properly the right star. Uh, I'm, I'm, well, there is an exception for the slitless uh, spectroscope because if you are in slit, uh, with a slitless spectroscope, uh, in this case, you can see the field of view uh, that you're observing. But if you put a slit, which is the case is most of in swimmers, uh, then in this case, you are, you are doing a blind observation. So you, you have a, a slit in front of your, your spectroscope, and then you have no way to, to, to know exactly where your, point, your telescope is uh, pointing at. Okay, and this is very important to have a system to point, to guide, and even to auto-guide uh, on your star. Um, so th this is really, um, uh, this is something really to consider. And also, this is why uh, when you are doing spectroscopy, most of the time you have a secondary camera, which is the guiding camera. And you can see on most uh, installation that you have the acquisition camera behind the, the, uh, the spectroscope. And the, you have a secondary camera, which is for the guiding. OK. Uh, there are some other uh, questions uh, to take uh, to, to ask yourself. Uh, so, do you want to have a, a fixed installation? Do you have an observatory, or are you using uh, you are, are you observing in uh, in nomadic way? I, I hope that the wording is correct. Um, so, if you if you have to uh, install and to set up all your instrument each night you want to observe, uh, then you have to select something which is very simple to use, simple to set up. And uh, on, of course, if you want to have a fiber fed instrument and, and something with uh, uh, several instruments to set up, uh, it is much more dedicated uh, to fixed observatories. Okay. And also there is something which is um, important um, in, in, the, uh, in, in, in our times uh, today is more and more people are using their setup, their telescope uh, remotely. So I really recommend to start in spectroscopy locally. So be just close to your telescope to understand what happens, what you're observing, what you are seeing. I think it's, it's really necessary. But if you want to use it um, uh, remotely, then you, you have to be sure to make sure that the, the spectroscope you are, that you are using, and of course, all your, your telescope can be uh, used remotely. And this is not the case for all the instruments. And uh, uh, last details, uh, uh, last detail about this uh, technical concern is in spectroscopy, we are talking about the color of the stars, of course, because this spectroscopy means that we are, we are spreading out all the colors of uh, a rainbow. Uh, but we always, uh, always prefer uh, to use black and white camera for a very basic reason. Um, the, uh, uh, in fact, the, the job of the spectroscope is to convert the wavelengths than the color in a geometrical position of the sensor. So we don't need to have the color at the end because the, the color is converted in a position of the sensor. You know what I mean? So in the, and, and in this case, it, it's a pity to have a color camera because a, a color camera means that you have a bio matrix. So you have some blue, some red, and some green pixels. And, and if you are in a in part of the spectrum where there is only some red light because of the geometry of the instrument, you will use only uh, one pixel, the red pixel, and the other one will be totally unuseful. So any color camera will be uh, much less efficient uh, than a black and white camera. So even if it's not intuitive, when you are doing spectroscopy, always, always prefer a black and white camera. Again, if you already have a, a color camera and if you want to jump into spectroscopy, do uh, you, of course, you can do it. Uh, but uh, if you want to have something performant, uh, you'll, you'll have to take that uh, into account. 
this is an, an, an image or made uh, uh, with a star analyzer. A star analyzer means that you, you just put a small uh, grating uh, in front of uh, your lens and, 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 and or your sensor. It can be a DSLR like, like that. This is an old picture again. And you can put your, your this uh, device on the back of your telescope and then you are very close to the, 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 the structure of the, the setup that you use to do um, imaging or photometry. The only difference is that, that you put a grating, uh, diffraction grating in the light path. Okay, And the result is that you can see all the stars as usual, but each star is accompanied by a spectrum. Okay, you can see this star here, you have a bright spectrum here. You have this probably a star here, which makes this spectrum. And in this case, you have also a, a, a planetary nebula here. Uh, well, I, I guess this is M, uh, I guess this is M57, uh, of course. And in this case, you have the, the direct image and or what we call the zero order. And you have two emission lines, and then you, you have two bright images of, the, of the, the system, okay? So when you have star, you have a continuous uh, spectrum most of the time. You may have some absorption lines here. We can see some absorptions, of course, but you, most of the time you have a continuum with absorption or emission lines. Uh, in the case of uh, planetary nebula, you have only few emissions. This is why you can see some different uh, uh, images here. And of course, in this case, uh, we used a color camera, uh, which is just beautiful. Not very useful for, for the efficiency, uh, as I told you before, but of course, this is very uh, visual. Okay, so this is a, this star analyzer is really the slitless uh, spectroscope. So this is, we just put a grating, a diffraction grating in the light pass in a very common telescope. And this is the kind of result that you, you, you have. So uh, there is a lot of advantages. This is very simple. This is cheap then. This is very close to what you used to have. And, and, and you may have in a single picture, you may have a lot of uh, spectra, okay? And, and then also something important is that you can recognize uh, your field of view and then you can recognize exactly which star uh, you want to observe, okay? But, this is, in fact, um, so there is the star analyzer, or there are there are few um, few other uh, devices uh, like the star analyzer, which are just basic um, uh, diffraction uh, gratings, and and this is really what we call the the, the slitless system. It is wonderful for discovery, for, for starting in spectroscopy, again, because it is cheap and it is easy to use. There are some um, application field uh, in science, uh, like observing the, the novae and the supernovae because they are very faint. And, and because the instrument is uh, simple, its uh, optical efficiency is quite high. So it, it may be useful to observe um, uh, the, the, some uh, novae and supernovae uh, with this instrument, especially supernovae, which are fainter. And, and also the, 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 the point is that you, you have uh, very um, uh, wide features in, in these uh, spectra. So it's not a problem if you have only a low resolution. Of course, this analyzer is a very low uh, resolution instrument. Okay. Now, I, I told you that you, you have uh, to, to, to have a guiding system if you are using a slit. So now the idea is that instead of putting uh, just a grating in the light beam, you will put a, a, a like a, you will put a slit in, in the field of view and the, you will uh, spread out only the light that goes uh, through uh, this slit. And then you will have a, a secondary system, the guiding system, which will look at uh, the other, the, the telescope field of view. So in your guiding image, you will see the telescope field of view. So you can have a few stars in this case. And you will see also uh, a black uh, slit uh, in the guiding image. And if you, uh, move the telescope in the way that you put the, the star in the slit, then you will have this result. You will see the spectrum of this slit. 
of this star. Okay, and by the way, so we have uh, selected the threshold of the image in such a way that we can see the light pollution because you have a slit here. Then you can also at the same time as the star spectrum, you can observe uh, the, the sky pollution spectrum or the sky background uh, spectrum, okay? So this is important because uh, with the slit, you'll be able to uh, correct your spectrum from the sky pollution. But, and, and this is one of the reasons for which you can do uh, spectroscopy in city center, uh, which is to, today, uh, well, really not the case uh, for the uh, deep sky imaging. Well, to, have, to do deep sky imaging, you have to have a very clear sky where in spectroscopy, you can really observe in city center. Okay, so this is what you will see in the guiding image. And this guiding image has uh, several advantages. You can observe extended objects. Okay, so uh, because you will take only a thin uh, part uh, of, of your objects and then and you, you will spread out the light of this thin part. So even if you want to observe a, a, a comet or a galaxy or nebulae or anything that is extended, you can observe it. Where with the star analyzer, you cannot because all the, the uh, image will be mixed. In fact, the, all the, uh, the, the extended object we will be mixed with the, all the, the uh, all, all the different wavelengths. Okay. The the next point is that you can also use a calibration lamp. This is just because a calibration lamp is a kind of extended object. We we cannot have a very uh, point-like uh, light source uh, for the calibration light. Uh, so the calibration lamp makes an extended source, and uh, thanks to the slit, we can observe the calibration calibration spectrum. And when we do uh, this observation, uh, we illuminate the slit in the same condition as the star, and then we can really uh, after taking or before taking the star spectrum, we can take the calibration spectrum. And then because we know the calibration spectrum, because we have some known uh, uh, emission lines in this lamp, then we can calibrate uh, our spectrum, okay? Which is something much more complex uh, for the uh, for the star, uh, star analyzer, for instance. In fact, if you want to, to calibrate uh, your your star analyzer, if I come back to this image, you really have to consider the zero order here and 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 detect some lines to make sure that you can have a scale of the calibration. But the calibration will be different for each star. Okay, so you you have to recalibrate your image uh, your your spectrum for each star, which is not that easy. Where in this system, the, 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 in your image, uh, the position of the spectrum is always the same because it is given by the position of the slit. Okay, so it is much easier to calibrate. And uh, as I explained, you can correct the scale pollution. You will prevent having some spectral overlap. Of course, in, in this image, you may have some overlapping of uh, different spectra. And for instance, these two ones uh, there may, may mix and may overlap and, and may uh, mix uh, their information. Uh, where in, in this case, you will have only one or maybe two or three uh, spectra, but uh, for stars that are at different position in the in the slit. Okay, so this this prevent star spectral overlap, and also you have a constant resolution because you can understand that in this system the resolution of the spectrum is given by the size of the slit. If you have a bigger slit, you will have wider images of each lines. And, and this is really the slit uh, width that gives the resolution. And if you have, in, in, if you are using this kind of instruments, the star analyzer, uh, if you have a problem with the, 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 the guiding or the guiding during the exposure, you will lose some resolution. So depending on how uh, your observing conditions, you will change uh, the, the resolution of your observation, okay? So these are all the advantages of the slit spectroscope, which makes that at the end, all, almost all the, the, I would say, the serious observations are made with the slit spectroscope. Um, when I say serious observation, um, really you can do some serious things uh, with the uh, with the star analyzer, but it is really dedicated some to some applications. 
and uh, also the the well the, the fiber fed spectroscope where here we are talking about uh, high end spectroscope the idea is that we 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 only put what we call a, a guiding unit or figure uh, fiber injection and guiding unit uh, at the telescope end that collects the light and send it uh, to an optical fiber uh, or fiber optics and, and and then we we send the fiber optics here it can it can be a uh, 5 10 20 meters long and we send this light to the entrance of the uh, spectroscope in this case this is an EGL spectroscope and the 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 advantage in this case is that we have the spectroscope which, which is um, isolated there is no more problem of uh, flexion of the instrument when you move uh, the telescope uh, around the sky uh, and then the system is very very stable and on top of that you can put it in uh, the temperature control room and that that makes that it is again it is very very stable so uh, very probably we, you will lose some light uh, in the fiber compared to a, a system where the, the spectroscope is at the end uh, at the back uh, of the telescope but the, the stability uh, will, will give another advantage and again i told you that most of professional uh, spectroscope are fiber fed instruments this is just because uh, they are huge. Uh, remember that if you use big telescope, you'll have big spectroscope. And if you want to put a big spectroscope, uh, which is, I mean, which is a very heavy, big behind a big telescope, you will have a lot of problem with the flexions, and and these flexions will totally break your um, your ability to do high resolution. So this is really the the fiber. The fiber arrives in the uh, 80s. And, and from this moment, the, 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 the fibers that allowed to separate uh, the telescope and the spectroscope, uh, it did open the door to the um, asteroseismology, so the, the, the way that uh, we can observe stars with a very high resolution instrument. Okay, But again, we are talking about high-end system. And and, uh, and that is, we have all the advantages of uh, the, the slit spectroscope, except that we have we we use a fiber so we we don't have a slit a long slit we have only one point in in, in which we put the, the the star and that means that we cannot collect the sky background at the same time so if you really need to do to have the sky background to correct your observation it means that after your star observation you'll have to do a new star of the sky background just beside uh, your star which which may take uh, more time Okay, so of course, in some cases, you have a double fiber, but it is a still more complex system. Okay, well, now, of course, uh, there is a question that the third key uh, or to, to select your instrument is the budget. So I, 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 I have not uh, given prices, and well, here I have many put the, uh, the, the, the instrument from Shediac Instruments, but you, you may have some other instruments. Um, here we are talking uh, with the star analyzer, we are, we are talking about um, hundreds, a uh, few hundreds of uh, uh, dollars. And um, um, uh, while well, for the LP, uh, which is the low resolution, uh, a very good instrument to, to start uh, to start in spectroscopy. And it is easy to use, it is light, it is small, so you can use with small instrument and so on. We are talking about a few thousands of dollars. Uh, here we are in the uh, high performance uh, instrument uh, from Sheliac. So the LISA here, the LRS3 here, and the UVEX. I will come back on the UVEX in a few seconds. And uh, we are talking about uh, something like three to five K uh, dollars. Uh, well, again, this is a, a range. And, and here we are more talking about uh, uh, 15, 70, well, 20, maybe 20 uh, with the full uh, set, uh, 20K uh, dollars. So, of course, the budget are totally different. And, and, and of course, you will not do the same, uh, the, the same kind of observations. And by the way, this is a pity, but uh, when it is simple, it is usually uh, more complex to use because you, you have uh, uh, more data reduction to do with a simple instrument. And this one can be very automated or these uh, instruments can be really automated. Where So the, 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 in, in fact, the, 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 the most complex the instrument, uh, the easiest, uh, easier it is to use. And here we have, uh, I will talk again uh, to the SOLEX in few seconds. I think this is something very important. It is uh, 
a, a small instrument. I think it is wonderful uh, to, to start with, but this is something very special. Now, uh, uh, and again, the, the start with your instruments. Uh, don't, you don't need to replace all your setup and, and use what you have uh, in hand uh, to start with spectroscopy. And I really recommend to start with basic instruments, especially if you don't know exactly what you want to do. Start with this time, the, the IP system, which is easy, which is very performing, which, is, uh, which, which will give uh, great, great results. Okay, so now I want to to uh, to talk about uh, the two newcomers. Uh, so the first one is the UVEX. Uh, the UVEX is a new instrument which is uh, made only of mirrors. So this is a Shonet Turner uh, architecture, and we only have uh, uh, mirrors. So it is a very achromatic. So we have put all our experience in this instrument, really. And the UVEX is. I, I like to say that this is the new generation of instrument. So it's very rigid, very robust, very easy to use because you, you never have to open the box. Uh, you can control uh, everything you need from outside of the instrument. You can uh, really do a lot of things. You can change the grating to have different resolutions. And because it is achromatic, because it uses only mirrors, Remember that I told you that I recommend to use a telescope with only mirrors. So if you do that, if you have uh, this kind of setups, uh, this is my own telescope at home. Uh, this is an RC8, so a rich Chrétien telescope. And there is only mirror. There is one mirror here. There is one mirror here. And there are two mirrors uh, inside the um, inside the UVEX. And this is a purely mirror instrument. So it is a purely achromatic. So it allows to go very deep in the blue end. So really, for we are discovering something totally new. And, and especially, we, we, we take the advantage of all the new uh, CMOS cameras that can go very far in the blue. And we can also go very far in the red. We are close to the one micron uh, wavelengths here, which is, again, totally new uh, for us. And this is a, a new landscape that, that we can open with this instrument. You know, so we have. Here, what you can cover. So here, this is the, the gray part is all the infrared. And really, when we usually we 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 go down to a H and K lines, so in the blue, in the deep blue here, and we go to the visible uh, to, to the visible end. So we we usually we use to cover this range. Now we can really go. Uh, deep here in the in the uh, blue part, and we can very, go very far uh, in the infrared compared to what we used to do. Okay, so again, I'm talking about amateur world, and today, the, the really because this system is totally achromatic, we are we are only limited by the the camera sensitivity, which is roughly from uh, 350 nanometers to uh, one micron. Okay, and well, the, it is also very uh, really ready for remote operation, which is important uh, nowadays. And uh, beware that we also have a, a, this this UVEX uh, system was designed um, at the beginning by, by Christian Bill and a small team in France. And uh, the, the first project was and still is in uh, 3D printing. So there are some people who did uh, print uh, and made uh, themselves uh, this instrument. So the, the, the version that we propose at Sheliak is something very strong, very robust, and very advanced has an advanced mechanics. But if you want to play with it uh, with a, a very cheap uh, and affordable uh, solution, the, the, uh, this is feasible. And then uh, I'm close to the end. The, uh, the, the other one is uh, the Solex. Solex is something very special. It, it's not, it's, uh, Solex means Solar Explorer. Okay, and again, it is it is designed by Christian Bill, and I, I guess that most of you know know this guy who is uh, really incredible, and um, and we, we work closely uh, with Christian uh, very often, and you know that he he did design most of uh, the optics of our uh, instruments, and most of the instruments that amateurs are using today uh, are, have been designed by Christian, and uh, in this case, this is a spectroheliograph. So it means that the purpose of this instrument is to do some images of the sun like this. And uh, but to do that, we are using a spectroscope. And the idea is that if we do that with a single um, 
acquisition, we can rebuild the image of the sun at any wavelength which is contained in our spectra. The idea is that we put, again, this is a spectroscope, so we have a slit. And the idea is that we, we put the slit in front of the sun and we just, we stop the telescope and we let, we let the sun moving in front of the slit, uh, of the slit and we take uh, fast acquisitions and, and then we scan uh, all the sun uh, by doing that. And after that, we, we each uh, image is something like that. So in this case, we can see the H alpha line, for instance, we can, again, we can rotate the grating to see different uh, wavelengths, but in this case, this is a H alpha line. And um, the, the, uh, we can observe in this region and then select these parts and rebuild the image uh, at, for instance, at the H alpha uh, wavelengths. And then this is like if you use a filter, but a very, very, very narrow filter, okay? And, and in fact, a much narrower, uh, narrower filter uh, that, that you can find uh, on the market. This is very interesting because you are taking images, but to do that, you are using a spectroscope. And again, this is a 3D printing system. This is a very cheap solution. And, uh, and, and this is a very successful instrument because a few days ago, uh, we have shipped uh, the first run and it, it has a wonderful success because we have shipped 160 units of the uh, kits. Uh, in, in fact, at Chediac, we did provide the two lens that are here and here, the grating, which is here, and the slit, which is here. And all the other parts are made by, by people in 3D printing. So this is something very cheap. And the, this is wonderful because you build your own instrument, so you, you know how it works. You have the, the, the URL of the website of Christian about uh, this uh, instrument. The website has been um, uh, translated in English uh, so, uh, recently, and, and we, which is very good. And, and really, this is wonderful because you, you build your instrument, so you, you understand what you are doing. This is very uh, affordable. And, and by the way, Christian did some demonstration that it can also be used in some conditions, certain conditions as a star X or a star explorer. So uh, I mean, not only for the sun, but also for stars. And in this case, it, it, for the stars, we use it as a normal spectroscope and not, uh, we, we don't scan the object, but we just put, uh, we, we have to put a, a slit and a guiding uh, system in front of the slit and we can point, uh, point at any star. Okay, and by the way, so this week we have shipped the first uh, units and this is a very, very successful program, very impressive program. And, and in fact, I'm, I'm very proud because today it was uh, sunny uh, today. Well, I'm in France, we are uh, late in the evening now. And, uh, but to this afternoon, the weather was wonderful and we have made our own first observations with the Solex. And it is just, uh, well, it's just wonderful to do it. It's, it's fun and you see when, when, when the sun is scanning, uh, you, you can see some um, some changes in the spectrum because of uh, some uh, uh, black spots and, and things like that. So it's it's really wonderful and it's a wonderful way to discover spectroscopy and and and, and to make beautiful images. Okay, well I've almost finished. Um, some recommendations. Uh, start with your telescope and your setup. Don't think that you have to buy a big instrument and to change everything. Uh, use what you have. Uh, keep in mind that you can use small instruments uh, for spectroscopy. Uh, something important, start with the spectro on a table. Uh, you know that you have a telescope, which is one instrument, and we have a spectroscope, which is another instrument. Uh, put the two instruments under control separately. And when you are familiar with the telescope and familiar with the spectroscope, then at this moment, you can attach them together. If you want to go too fast and have quickly a star spectrum, you will face problems, I'm, I'm sure. Okay, of course, start with by stars. And, and uh, this is something also very important. Um, I've explained to you at the beginning that uh, you, you, when you are doing spectroscopy, there is one step to acquire the 2D images and another step, which is to do the data reduction. Please consider that the data reduction is the core operation. So uh, it's a mistake to say, well, I, I do take uh, today images and I, I will see later on how I can uh, reduce uh, this data. You must do the reverse. 
perfectly understand the data reduction process and then you will understand which kind of image you have to give to this process to make it very easy to work in this case you can really process your data in a few clicks in a few seconds but if you if you want to do the other way you will spend a lot of time to to try to manipulate your data to be able to to have a result okay so really the core is the data reduction this is important to understand uh, well, a few examples very, very quickly, just to, to give you uh, some images. Um, the, the, this is a spectrum of actuaries. All this spectra has been taken the same day with the same instrument. It was a C8 telescope, few seconds observation. Uh, it, it, and you have different, this, this is with an LP600. And uh, so this is actuaries. You can see a cool star that the spectrum is uh, going up. Um, uh, this is Vega, the, the, the probably the most, the first uh, star that you have to observe in spectroscopy, which is a hot star. You can see a very smooth profile and deep Balmer lines. So the Balmer lines means the hydrogen light, H alpha, H beta, H gamma, and so on. Okay, so this is Y7. This is a, um, uh, I think, a carbon star, if I'm right, uh, with, with a very, very complex instrument. So you, you when you see that the, this is taken with exactly the same spectrum as this one so it means when you see all how it is smooth so it means that all the details here are significant so this is not noise this is really information okay this is impressive so gamma cassiope gamma cassiope is the this the the, the, the star in the middle of the w uh, of uh, cassiope it, it was the first um, discovered be stars where you see that for the H uh, uh, alpha and H beta lines, you have emissions, deep, uh, strong emissions where we used to have absorption lines. And this is what makes uh, BE stars so wonderful. Uh, I, I don't go in detail. So this is Altair. Uh, this is well, Epsilon uh, uh, CRB. Uh, uh, well, there are, these are where some uh, stars that we observe uh, during a, a public outreach. And people ask me, hold this one, this one, can we observe this one? So this gives some example. Beta Lyrae, uh, well, its common name is Sheliak. OK, you, you, you can see it. this is also a B star, uh, B star with a strong emissions. A very, very interesting uh, star. And uh, TCRB is, I think, a cataclysmic or symbiotic, um, always uh, mixing uh, the both uh, categories. But the, this is the, the, this in this start you also have some changes uh, very quickly when you have outburst. This is some examples of an outburst of a BE star. So QR view um, uh, have been seen. Uh, we, we follow it uh, in, in within the, the the program of BES, and uh, sometimes we have already seen uh, I think four or five outbursts of this star uh, for ten years now, and and we this is the usual status and from time to time you see that because you have some emissions um, out of the star and that 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 is uh, um, uh, what well, this is out also some material is um, is um, uh, how it is uh, I cannot find the word is emitted is um, uh, sandic out sandic out, sanded out of the star and this is another example, uh, V442 Andromeda, with a different outburst. So it is always the same H alpha region. Okay, and in some cases it's in, it's in absorption. You may have some emissions with two uh, emission lines uh, combined with some absorptions. So you know it's there is some complex uh, profile, and at different times you see the different uh, results. Well, I've finished. Um, uh, if you are interested, uh, maybe you you are already you already know that, but I've written a book uh, to help you starting in spectroscopy, and uh, and that's it. I think I've finished. I'm hope. hope Thank I'm you very much, late. Francois. That was great. Uh, we've got a couple of questions that have come in here. We're going to go ahead mm -hmm. and get to those. Um, so. We have a question from an anonymous attendee who had asked which setup would be best for measuring the cosmic redshift of galaxies can i do that with a star analyzer or do i need a slit spectrograph and what resolution 
Well, when you the, 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 as, as soon as you want to to talk about uh, redshift, uh, when you mean a redshift, you mean Doppler effect, and Doppler effect most of time is synonymous to um, high resolution. So this is not always true, but but this is a, a general consideration. If you want to measure radial velocities, you have to use uh, um, you have to use high resolution. Uh, would you mind uh, clarifying generally what, like, in order of magnitude value is high resolution? Uh, uh, good point. Um, well, of course, it depends on your telescope, but I, I would say that with a, a small telescope, like um, uh, eight, ten inch telescope, um, I know that you, 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 with this kind of small telescope, you, you, you can go in low resolution with an LP, for instance, or with a LISA, you can go up to uh, 13, 14, maybe 15 uh, magnitude. Um, with, uh, with the high resolution, uh, with uh, a LIRIS-3, for instance, or with an E-shell spectroscope, it can be, uh, you, you, you would be limited to, uh, I would say, magnitude 7 or 8 at, at maximum. This is to have a, a kind of ID. Um, but uh, of course, it depends of your. It depends on your exposure time. It depends on your telescope diameter. Thanks. All right. Uh, so Patrick Cavanaugh had asked, "What is the maximum error in guiding that can be acceptable when using a slit spectroscope at low resolution uh, without losing the star?" Um, well, again, it depends on, on it depends on your setup, but the the. Um, uh, well, first, there is something uh, which is important is um, if you have a slit spectroscope, if you have problems of tracking, uh, of guiding, uh, you, you, you may lose some light because your, your, the, the starlight will not go in, inside the slit, but uh, your uh, spectrum will remain correct, you know, so there, is, there will be no movement of, of the spectrum. So if, if you don't have a good guiding, if you have a problem in the guiding, you will lose some efficiency, uh, but, but your spectrum will be correct, but you will have a lower uh, signal, to, uh, signal to noise ratio, okay? Uh, and, and also something important is uh, when, once you have uh, defined your setup, um, you, you, you may have, um, in, in, in fact, you, you, you can spend some time to define the proper setup and have the, the, the right installation. But once it is done, when you are doing the light and when you are observing, the only thing you have to do is to make sure that you put as much light as possible in the slit. Okay, so and to do that, uh, tuning uh, the parameter of your auto guiding is something very important to 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 improve it. Now I don't have um, uh, well to give you an idea on my telescope at home, which uh, again I have uh, an uh, RC one. Uh, RC8 telescope on uh, uh, 10 micron mount, and, and and this is really a great setup, uh, much better than the one I had before. I can I, I do have an, an error, uh, guiding error of uh, uh, something uh, around one or two arc seconds, uh, well depending on the on the weather. I know that uh, Olivier Gard, who who worked with uh, with, with us and. He has probably much better setup than I do. He, he told me a few days ago that he, he, he is less than one arc second. But well, I, 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 it, it depends on the focal of the focal length of your instrument and so on. That makes sense. Thank you. All right, and uh, last question it looks like comes from Yannick Delis, who has said that. They don't know what they want to do, but they do want to make uh, useful contributions to science. So what kind of observations are amateur contributions most needed for these days? Huh. The, the, this question is interesting and uh, it, it opens um, an opportunity for me to give something important, I think. When you are doing uh, spectroscopy, uh, what I've seen is that you, you need some time to put your system, your setup under control and to understand what you're doing, understand the, the most common mistakes uh, you may do and so on. And so it takes some time to, to be familiar with the system and it, it takes some patience, of course. Um, the, the, but 
really, I think this is very valuable in spectroscopy, much more than in imaging. In spectroscopy, one day you can say, okay, I know how to proceed. I know how to make a spectrum. And at this moment, you can forget the techniques because you, you master it. And, and then you can switch to science. This is something very important. Take the time to control your system and then switch to science. Uh, now, in, in, which, um, in, in which area? So today we, we have uh, several um, uh, programs. And, and really, I think uh, I would say that, <laughs> uh, well, you know, personally, I, I like very much the BE Star uh, program because I was involved in from the beginning. And this is something wonderful for the uh, amateur astronomer. But uh, the, the, you, you have a lot of programs to do. And I, I know that, you know, the, 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 the uh, professor Knigge just before who say that the contributions uh, from the amateur is important. I'm sure that this is the kind of meetings when you meet people, when you have collaborations between professionals and amateurs, this is uh, what creates new opportunities for observations. You know, so I know that, for instance, for the BE Star program, we need more and more observers because we need to observe as often as possible more and more stars. So we, if we could uh, double or be uh, three, five times more observers than today, the, the, there is a job for everybody. So you are much, much than welcome to, to, to participate. But this is the same for a lot of, uh, of programs. And, and I'm sure that the more we are, the, the more we'll open uh, opportunities to collaborate. It's all very true. I'd like mm -hmm. to just uh, add on to the end of that real quick, because uh, I think that this is very cool. A lot of the BE stars in the sky are extremely bright stars. So you yep. don't need a great limiting magnitude to get involved. Like the example you gave of Gamma Cassiopeia being one of the main stars in Cassiopeia. Yeah. Well, Gamma Cassiopeia is probably not the most interesting because it is very stable. So it's it's yes. it is so easy to do, and so it's well, the first time you observe it, you say, "Wow, something is happening there." Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but yeah, you are right. You are perfectly right. The the uh, the B well, stars, generally speaking, are bright. Well, then, uh, if you want more interesting, I guess you can go with Zeta Tauri. <laughs> that one's cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> All right, um, we got a couple, actually a couple extra questions that came in while you were answering that one. Um, so first one, Supash Gadam had asked, with a fiber spectroscope, how do you make sure that the star is focused onto the end of the fiber? Well, the, this is the same principle of the uh, of a slit spectroscope. You have a guiding system. So, in fact, the the uh, uh, the, 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 the the fiber hole uh, uh, is made in a mirror, uh, and then the image of the of the field of view of the telescope is sent back uh, to a secondary image. And then, instead of seeing in in the middle of the image, you cannot see the slit because this is a fiber. But in this case, you can see a black hole in the middle. Image middle of the image and your job is to put the star in the in this black hole and and when you in the guiding image when the star uh, goes in the in the fiber in the hole uh, then the the light is not sent back to the uh, in fact the light goes in the spectroscope so it, it, it you cannot see it anymore in the guiding image so you you can see that the the, the star is disappearing in the fiber the, the same way as if you have a, a, slit, a slit spectroscope, when the, the star crosses uh, the slit, you, you see it disappearing uh, from the Gadi image, which is a very good, a, a good sign that the light is going through the telescope. Thank you. All right. Uh, we had a question about the Solex. Does it need uh, slit guiding? <laughs> No, <laughs> so uh, the Solex, so the Solar Explorer, uh, is is not using the. Uh, the you, you don't need to have a, a guiding system, but you have uh, anyway to point at the sun. And well, I, I just did it for the first time this afternoon, so I can talk about that. And the the you, you just have to find, you know, on on the. Uh, we, we, we are using a small telescope and there are two rings uh, that attach the telescope. And in fact, we use the first ring shadow 
uh, to align it on the second ring uh, to make sure that we are pointing at the sun. And, and the idea in this system is that we, by moving the telescope slightly, you, you, you see when you are on the sun because you see a wonderful spectrum. Okay, and the idea is that you, you move the slit just in front of the sun and then you stop the motor of the, uh, of the mount and then you, you, you see that the, the, because of the natural movement of the sky, the sun will, will, you will scan naturally uh, the, 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 the spectrum. So in this case, in fact, we, we stop the mount. So in this case, there is no tracking issue. Uh, the system is very stable and, and we, we proceed this way. Again, this is a very simple system and that works. And so it's a wonderful way to, to, put, the, to put the hands on. Yeah, very nice. Uh, so if you were to use your Solex for um, stars other than the sun then you would need to use guiding right and you need yeah. to add a guiding module yes absolutely in this case you you have to add some uh, some components to have a guiding system because again if you have a slit system if you don't have any guiding system you are you are you are mm -hmm. blind in fact and wh what you do is that we say well i have a good mount so i can uh, point at a stop very precisely but in fact it's never enough and by experience what you sh what you do is you point at your star you say well it should be somewhere here and you you try you make a spectrum there is nothing just black spectrum uh, and then you move a little bit around and you say you do, do, do continuous uh, imaging and then you wait for getting a spectrum and necessarily at one moment you'll have a star uh, that goes in the slit so in this case hey great i do have a spectrum and at this moment you say hey how can i know if this is the right star or not mm -hmm. so really you need a guiding system to make sure that you're observing uh, the, the guide and the right star that makes sense all right our last question for today uh comes from pradeep Kar karmarkar sorry for mispronouncing your name i'm pretty sure i just did that <laughs> how do you take calibration spectra and what software would you use okay so the, the the idea of the calibration spectrum is is to use a uh, the idea is to use a, a non spectrum and usually we use some calibration lamp and the calibration lamp is just a, a lamp with some gases like uh, neon argon thorium or things like that uh, some gases for which we have emission lines few emission or few or high number of emission lines uh, for which we perfectly know the wavelengths Okay, so in fact, you have a pattern of lines and, and we can recognize this pattern. And thanks to this pattern, we, we can say, okay, this line is at uh, this wavelength, this other line has this uh, other wavelength and so on. So the idea is that when, when you have your instrument properly set up, you do an observation of your star and exactly in the same conditions, uh, so you don't change anything in your instrument. And then you put some calibration light uh, in front of the slit. And in this case, you will be able to, to do this, uh, this, uh, this calibration. And regarding the, the, the software, uh, well, the, well there, there are several uh, available uh, software. Um, within Sheliac, we developed for some years uh, the Demetra software, uh, which, is, uh, which covers uh, from the acquisition to the data reduction, including uh, acquisition of the target image, flat image, calibration images, and so on. And, and, and the idea is to have a very automatic process. Uh, there is also uh, a lot of people uh, who are using the ISIS software, so, uh, which is the software from Christian Duil, and we, which has which is very very powerful, which is probably more complex to use. Uh, the, the, the interface is more more complex to understand, but when, when you understand it, it is very, of course very powerful. And you also have uh, other software like uh, like Bass, like R Spec, like uh, Visual Spec to, to do the software comparison and so on. And we, we have a lot of uh, resources and information on our website, of course, if this can help. All right, thank you. That looks like that's it for our questions. So I'm going to go ahead and put up our end card here. All right. Um, first, before I get to the closing announcements, I would like to extend a huge thank you to both Dr. Nigga and uh, Mr. Koshard for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. I would also like to thank again our sponsors, DC3 Dreams and Voice Astro. 
DC3 Dreams provides high-end observatory automation and web-based multi-user remote imaging. The AAVSO Net Observatories use DC3 Dreams ACP Expert for the Bright Star monitors and other programs. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey Project, also known as APAS, has used ACP Expert's AI scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields, hands off, at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night. This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects in about 99% of the sky. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in a scientific journal, such as the Journal of the AVSO. Today's webinar has been recorded, and the recording will soon be made available for free on the AAVSO's YouTube channel, where you can find a full library of webinars just like these. Go check it out, and while you are there, consider subscribing to our channel. Not only will you get notified every time a new lecture is posted, but by hitting that little subscribe button, you will be increasing our educational reach by making YouTube more likely to suggest our videos to others. It's just one more way that you can help support the AAVSO. Speaking of support, this webinar series is being supported by you, the viewer. So please, if you're not a member, join the AAVSO. AAVSO membership comes with a wide array of benefits, including free access to our mentorship program. Our mentors can help you get started, whether it's visual observing or CCD photometry or even spectroscopy we can help. And as always, we would be so grateful if you would consider donating to the AAVSO. Every donation matters and goes towards making programs like this come to life.